Okay, it's Monday. Mm, my goodness, Monday noon, and we're back with Energy 808, the cutting edge, with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us by phone from Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, from wow, from from uh, uh, what's the name of your company, Marco? Provision Solar. Uh, last I checked, it was Provision Solar. Provision Solar in Hilo, Hawaii. I've been there. I've seen it. It's a large arrangement there. So, uh, Marco, can we talk about these protests uh, that? that are sort of anti-energy anti protests and where they come from and what they mean, what they signify, and where they're going to go and the effect they have. Um, you know, it seemed to start out this year at uh, TMT. Um, there have been no protests at PGV yet, but I expect there will be. Uh, and then it sort of spread to Oahu, where there were two uh, uh, wind, wind installations, both of which had been approved and permitted. Um, and, uh, and they, in fact, uh, they were being built and, uh, or the trucks were on the road, you know, they go midnight and, and carry the sections of the wind turbines. So they don't, they don't uh, get in the way of traffic. And there were protests, um, on, there have been protests on both of them, um, on, on these, uh, wind, wind facilities in Oahu. And I can't help but think that there's a connection between the protests uh, on TMT and the protests on the wind facilities, although, you know, it's hard to find a common denominator except that people like to protest. Do you have any thoughts about this? Do I have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I certainly do, and I'm trying to uh, decide how to proceed. I think I'm going to take kind of the broader view uh, on the subject and uh, the, the, birds, the bird's eye view or the above the wind turbines view and then kind of drill down a little bit further. And to me, Jay, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it really begs the question, uh, who's, who's paying for lunch? And what I mean by that is kind of a play on, the, on the, the phrase, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And in this case, I'm thinking there's no such thing as a free lunch when it comes to energy sources that uh, even though, comparatively speaking, uh, renewable energy, principally in the form of, let's say, solar and wind uh, is more more better, more benign than uh, some type of uh, hydrocarbon-based uh, power generation. Uh, so, again, generally speaking, uh, I think there's quite a consensus among many, many people that renewable energy more better than uh, fossil fuel energy. So, uh, that said, um, a choice to, or the choice to install a, a wind farm in the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, with wind towers that will be the highest ever in the state. I mean, 500 plus feet. Uh, when you look at the total span of these three-bladed wind turbines, I mean, these are these are big hubbies, and there, as anybody who's been watching and reading the news over the past few weeks, there's been a, a, no shortage of arrests of people protesting the wind farm, uh, as well as an act of rather serious malicious. Uh, not even mischief, but uh, but felonious assault on a on a Helco power pole, and that was somebody took a chainsaw to and caused it to to effectively collapse. Which you know you're talking potential for not only serious injury but death when you're dealing with big power poles. So unfortunately, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's uh, the proposal to burn biomass at this power plant up in Pipikeo or on this island, whether it's drilling down into Madame Pele, as, as had been the case for over 25 years up until the eruption of last year, uh, that there is no cost-free choice and that there will likely continue to be a constituency from small, medium to large well, that will find a reason to protest vigorously and risk arrest and risk uh, more than arrest uh, to stop a given project. And, and my concern you know, without really looking at the specific merits or lack thereof uh, for any particular project, again, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's biomass, whether it's geothermal, is when we go down the path of saying no, no to wind or no to biomass, no to uh, acres and acres of solar uh, that are going to bother someone in terms of their view plane from their condo in Waikoloa, uh, we effectively pin ourselves into a corner more and more as a state when we are still, as we've talked about before, my friend, we are still so incredibly dependent 
uh, this, this state's economy on imported oil to the tune of, last I looked, 83%. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of a broken CD in this respect, but I'm still struck by the fact that decades' worth of efforts, uh, notable efforts and uh, valuable efforts and legitimate efforts to become more energy independent and more energy resilient uh, haven't haven't moved the needle nearly far enough, and I think there's widespread agreement on that. And yet, what what do we do uh, when the, re the rubber hits the road, so to speak, when AES wants to put in a uh, another multi-megawatt wind farm in North Shore of Oahu, and uh, clearly there are a lot of people who, who just don't want that. So it, it really just kind of paints us into a corner. You know, the proverbial, you're, you're painting the the... the the floor of a particular room, and uh, uh, you're not going about it strategically, and you end up in a corner because you you don't want to walk across the wet paint that you just put down. So, with that, I will I will quiet down and and uh, and look forward to your response. Oh, I uh, response is more like an agreement. I'm I'm so concerned about this because these are obviously progressive maneuvers, and um, you know, good for the powers that be that they gave them permits. Um, although it took a long time. Think about how much you have to do to get a permit for a wind farm. You know, you have to get control of the land, negotiate a lease. Uh, you have to put in for, you know, uh, I don't know, zoning issues, and, and um, you have to get financing to find somebody who will actually build it. Um, you have to get a permit from um, whatever the authority is in, in Oahu that's the Department of Planning and uh, Permitting. Um, gee, there's so many things. The checklist is a mile long, and you go through all this, and you get, you know, you get approval, you get a lease, uh, you get a permit. You've done, you know, years of bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic effort, and then mm, there's somebody out in the street opposing you. Now, what's interesting about it is that the people out in the street, um, just as in the case of TMT. Uh, had the opportunity to raise the same objections uh, when the permitting process was going on, but they either didn't or they lost, they lost the argument. And so, you know, you have a whole thing about the rule of law, uh, about respecting the rule of law. It's an alternative system to just ignore the rule of law, ignore the permit, ignore the process that the capital, the capital concentration had to go through to get the permit and get the project underway. And, uh, and then you, you ignore all of that, and uh, you're unsympathetic to it. You don't care about it. You don't care about their goals either, you know, to, uh, to deal with climate change or to make money, either one. Um, and, you, and you have your alternative system, which is protest. Protest and do, and do uh, you know, violence to telephone poles and the like. Uh, sabotage. So you say to yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Don't people understand how important this is? Don't they understand that we're, we're spending six, seven billion dollars for fossil fuel that we won't have to spend if we build these, uh, you know, clean energy facilities here in the state? That the money, you know, you won't, your money will go to the clean energy facilities. It won't go out of state for, for uh, fossil fuel. Furthermore, you know, we won't be on the wrong side of the tracks as far as climate change is concerned. Um, although, you know, there is a legitimate argument that we're so small, so tiny that it doesn't have that much effect. I think we have to do our part. We have to be conscious, aware. We have to be connected to the global, the global thinking on this. And, you know, and finally, you know, uh, are, kids, are kids learning about this in school? I was telling you before we started, Marco, that there was a piece on NPR. Uh, this morning about how, you know, like less than 50% of the kids in the state uh, can swim. They can't swim. Most kids can't swim in a state that's surrounded by water, in a state where it's all of its history and culture is defined by water. Most kids can't swim. I find that extraordinary, and, I'm, and I would like to do a show about it. I also, uh, I also told you about a, a trip that Think Tech took to Lanai. At the time, the cable, you know, the cable from Lanai to Oahu was, was in play, and there were all these arguments going on. We went to the school there, and I guess uh, we attended a class, took pictures of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a lecture, a talk, by one of the people from, um, you know, uh, I guess it was from the, 
the, the cable, the ones who wanted to build, Murdoch's company wanted to build the cable. And um, so the question he put rhetorically to this class was, how, how big in diameter do you think the cable is? Silence, crickets. One, one young student stood up and he said, I know, it's six feet in diameter. Okay, well, he didn't know anything. And that school, this is junior high school or maybe high school, that school had not taught him anything about an issue that was in play in Lanai to the exclusion of most other issues for a couple of years. He didn't know anything about it. So yeah. are schools doing a job? Uh, are they teaching about energy? Are they teaching kids about climate change? Are they teaching kids um, you know, about solar cells and the grid? Uh, are they teaching kids about wind? Are they teaching kids about uh, geothermal? Uh, or, or, or the kids coming up in the state not knowing as much about energy as they do about swimming? You know, I, I think there's a failure here and it's likely to continue. And I think what we see in this, in this uh, ongoing and, and, and in fact, this uh, viral protest that we see running from the Big Island now to Oahu on cable, I'm sorry, on, uh, on, on wind, um, is, you know, it's an example of people not really knowing what the deal is. And I don't know where we start, you know, it sounds like we haven't had good educational leadership for a long time, uh, and, and people are just off in the wrong direction um, as, a, as a, a huge detriment to um, progress in energy. Uh, so I guess, I guess it's, it's clear we have a problem. And the question is, how do we deal with this? Because it's gonna happen again, Marco. Uh, to, you know, I, I, I give kudos to the HPD people who effectively moved in and stopped the uh, protests on the North Shore. But I don't think the, the matter is over. I think it will happen again. And I think that, uh, you know, the electric company, and for that matter, the PUC, and for that matter, you know, people who support efforts uh, dealing with climate change and want to see clean energy, they're all frustrated by this. Why in the world would you have a grassroots movement against the obviously better choice. And how do we deal with that, Marco? You got some ideas. If I made you governor, what would you do? Well, I'd rather be energy czar with uh, unlimited power to, to issue edicts from, from my perch. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, what will it take? What will it take for us to do what we targeted to do? What will it take for us to do what we talk about all the time? We just well, don't, don't have the action to back it up. To me, it's, it's kind of more tangible and more challenging when you kind of strip away the, the, the more generic uh, nature of your question, Jay, and look specifically, let, let me look at the Big Island as a case in point, okay? In 2017, the Big Island produced somewhere around 50 percent of the ener of the electricity consumed on this island 57 percent probably even more because I think uh, rooftop solar is likely undercounted by by the utility company but let's just say 57 percent that's what they reported to the PUC that was the total out of the total electricity generated and consumed uh, on our island in 2017 close to 60 percent was renewable okay last year in 2018 that dropped to 43 43 point something percent. Let's round it up to 44. So obviously 57 is higher than 44. And then my prediction is that that's going to be a comparable figure this year in terms of somewhere around the mid 40s for Helco because uh, PGV will not go back online by the end of the year. If it ever goes back online, it definitely will not go back online within the next two months. So we have gone in the, in the wrong direction, right, in terms of energy independence on this island. And what do we do, what can we do to reverse that? Well, one of the ways we can reverse it uh, is if you want to count the combustion of biomass as renewable energy, which a lot of people do, uh, we have the case in point of Huhonua up the coast in Pepekeo, right, roughly 20 plus megawatts. And here the developers of Huhonua have spent, by their accounting, Jay, somewhere over $200 million to date, okay? And they have gone through processes with negotiating a power purchase agreement with Helco. They were able to achieve regulatory approval back uh, several years ago, only to have a lawsuit in the Hawaii Supreme Court essentially overturn that particular PUC agreement in 2017 and remand it back to the commission, 
uh, in order for the commission to look at greenhouse gases and the effect on environmental quality from the emissions that would come from these stacks there at Huho Noa. So here you have, to pick up on a point you made a little while ago, you have people who played by the rules, who spent a lot of money playing by the rules, who got regulatory approval by the rules, and yet through the, 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 the work of Henry Curtis and Life of the Land, who successfully brought a lawsuit in the Hawaii Supreme Court, overturned that uh, by a five to nothing vote overturned that decision by the commission back in 2017. So here we have uh, the commission will be chewing, is chewing on this, and they will issue a decision, I'm going to say probably first half of next year, thumbs up or thumbs down. Will that power plant go back online? It's been in Maque since I think 2005, after they stopped burning um, coal prior to that, the gas. So, you know, if I made you energy czar, energy czar for the Big Island J, what would you do? Do you believe that burning biomass uh, at, uh, with a power purchase agreement for 30 years at 22 cents a kilowatt hour is a good move to make to reduce the state's dependence or this island's dependence on imported fossil fuels to power power plant? You don't need to make me an energy czar. Just make me a lawyer who is sitting in his office and uh, somebody from Wall Street calls and says, you know, we're really interested in energy because because Hawaii keeps saying that it's way ahead, you know, it's going to reach its target 2040, 2045 of 100% clean energy and all that. Um, so we, we were thinking of investing $200 million in clean energy in Hawaii. What do you say, Jay? What do you think my advice would be? I say, I would tell him, be careful. Because, uh, you, you know, you think you're doing all that you need to do, but then there's always a surprise. And uh, there was a surprise on Super Ferry. There was a surprise on Hohunua. Um, the, and the, gee whiz, there's certainly a surprise on, uh, on, on, on a 30 meter telescope. So who, who would make an investment like that? You know, our, our history and our brand and our reputation is littered with projects that had surprises and were killed. And if I were a lawyer or if I were a Wall Street investor, I would say, let's go somewhere else because it's moving faster somewhere else. Government understands the need for alacrity. Um, people are better educated about the benefits of clean energy and, and how to deal with climate change or the need to deal with climate change. Hawaii has lost its way, I would say. And I would say that within attorney-client privilege and everything. But, uh, you know, if I were being responsible and responsive to the question of the capital concentration and asked me that question, I would not necessarily encourage them to come here. And I think that kind of conversation is taking place. I think that kind of conversation is taking place on Wall Street. We have no way of knowing how many projects we've lost, how many investment dollars have not come here because of the things we've done. One thing after another, and every time it happens, you know, there's a huge effect in terms of future investment. And when they saw down a, uh, a telephone pole, they're sending a message all through Wall Street <clears throat> about how, you know, we got sabotage going on here. Maybe you should, maybe you should go somewhere else where that doesn't happen. Um, <clears throat> and, I, you know, to me, the most important thing about Ohunua or the Super Ferry uh, or uh, what was a 30-meter telescope is if the state makes promises and assurances, and if the investor goes through the process and gets permits, we don't want to surprise him. We don't want to turn him on his head, have the coins drop out of his pockets. That's not the right approach to uh, offshore investment. Think Tech had a program about this a few years ago, and it was really a powerful discussion because we, we don't respect offshore investment. We treat it either as a, as a scam, which is which is, you know, not, not, a right, not a right approach, or we treat it as, um, um, uh, uh, you know, they, if they're from the mainland, they must be right. Uh, sacred cows, they must be right. And therefore, we buy into it, and everybody makes a mistake. We have to manage offshore investment, and we haven't, we haven't really done that. And I would add that, you know, here we are, we've rejected... Uh, thanks to the governor, we've rejected LNG. 
So we haven't done anything for LNG or with LNG, while the whole country, in fact, the whole world is moving ahead on LNG as a cheaper, um, you know, cleaner solution as a bridge fuel um, on the way to clean energy. So what's happened, as you said, is we really haven't made that much progress on clean energy, lots of aspirations, and no bridge arrangements like LNG. Um, and I, you know, where are we going on this? Do we really believe what we say? And, and it's questionable. Well, I'm going to put you again to the test, my friend. And, uh, and if you were a member of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, would you be in favor of allowing Huho Nua to, to come online when all is said and done and to burn trees, whether they're from the Hamakua coast or whether they're from thousands of miles away? Is that, a, is that in the public interest, Jay? Is it in the public interest to have a power plant along the Hamakua coast that is burning biomass? Is, is that more better than the alternatives? My answer is there's other <laughs> factors in play. And they call me you know, business oriented. But if, if those investors have gone this far, uh, then I would let them do it. There may be negative aspects to it, but we have to move. We have to keep going. Was, there was another project, uh, I can't remember the name right now, um, in the Big Island, um, in Pahala it was, uh, that was, that was smashed a few years ago. Um, and those guys lost a ton of money. They were local investors too. So, you know, we have to move ahead. So if I were in the lead here, if I were leading at the gov governor's level or at the energy office level, uh, I would say, let's move it. Let's move it. Let's get going. Let's not get tied up in process all day. None of these projects so has a useful life of that burning, long anyway. The burning trees on this island is, some, is a reasonable trade-off in order to avoid burning something else. That's, that's, what I'm, that's my takeaway in what you're saying. Oh, yes, because it, the useful life of that project is not that long. And we just have to sort of work our way to clean energy. But we have to keep working. Uh, we can't let it go, and we can't keep on relying on fossil fuel. So, yeah, yeah I, think, I think the most important thing is to keep going and show political will that we want to get there. You know, all these decisions um, and all these um, surprises uh, actually hold us up. And we're sort of fascinated with the process, um, but, but what happens is we haven't made nearly uh, the progress that we'd hoped to make. I've been following this for 10, 15 years, and I haven't seen the, pro the progress we were talking about at the beginning in the middle what years. I haven't seen that progress. We, we have all it's these combusting. targets and goals, but we, we're not really making enough progress. Is combusting trees clean energy? Well, I guess you could say it's, it's tree fuel but it is not fossil fuel like oil. If you disagree with me, then say so. I do, I do, and I've, you know, I've given this a lot of thought, and uh, burning anything in terms of new power generation, I've come uh, to a place of having a very hard time with, at least in, in our neck of the woods, whether it's this island or in this state. Uh, and yet, uh, I also question, for example, this island has a serious uh, solid waste problem in terms of the landfill and Hilo is uh, not far away from being filled up, right? So if it fills up here, that means it has to go somewhere, and the somewhere is on the west, to the west side of the island where there's a landfill that has more room. And obviously, uh, people haven't come up with a way of magitating, uh, mag magically levitating waste from here from point A to point B with no energy being used, right? So we're talking about fossil fuels used to have trucks going on six, seven day, uh, seven day a week hauls to move waste from the east side of the island to the west side. So in that regard, I ask myself, well, what, what would I think about some type of waste to energy plant here, which has been talked about from time to time over the years for, for this island. And it's being talked about again, in fact. So again, waste, waste to energy. Uh, if, if the, you know, as a purist, uh, we'd all like to be more pure, or at least I'd like to be more purist and less purist, but at the same time, 
when you look from the perspective of, well, we're going to burn waste to energy here on this island and put, obviously, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, but that in, in return will, will reduce the amount of, of fossil fuel used to transport waste from the east side of the island to the west side of the island. I guess kind of my takeaway here is uh, one, one sh probably should be more of a practical purist than a purist purist. And that's something that uh, I will endeavor to do. And, uh, and again, to go back to the point I made at the beginning of the, the show, is you know we can't keep on saying no uh, to, uh, to, to, to these ways of, uh, it, it's not the ultimate good. It's not, it's not uh, the, uh, there's no such thing as an ideal solution when it comes to energy. There are always going to be trade-offs and always costs. So, yeah, don't let the, yeah. uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. I've seen exactly. that one before. But you know, exactly. <clears throat> one thing that strikes me is that uh, the utility goes out with these RFPs and it says, uh, you know, why don't you make a proposal? All you guys, across the country, across the world, why don't you find some money, find hundreds of millions, and come and make a proposal? And, and we'll take uh, any proposal that gives us uh, arguably other than fossil fuel. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the definition is, but the definition of the RFP is approved. The RFP is approved by the PUC. And one of the reasons that the definition is broad is because it's hard to get people anywhere in the world um, to invest hundreds of millions of dollars, especially with our reputation for surprises. So you go out wide, and then you let them come in, uh, and then you, you, know, you have this competition among them, and, and then you, you pick one you like, and you go to the, uh, the PUC, and you say, is this one okay? And the PUC says, it's okay. So you know, the problem is that that whole process is, is daunted. Um, by the fact that you got to get people to, to spend the money to invest. Um, so you try to make it broad enough, and you give them plenty of rope so they can come in and, and do their thing and respond to the RFP and then go ahead, invest the money, and, and, uh, build, and build the facility. I, if we made a very tight definition and said only wind, only solar, nothing else, then I, I, I expect there'd be less money coming in. And the whole thing is to well, entice capital come to Hawaii. We've done a really good job on, on not enticing capital to come to Hawaii. And I think we're getting better at that. Uh, so whatever the system is, we've got to make it clear to prospective investors that this is a safe haven for their money. What do you think about that? I think from the, you're absolutely right, Jan. I think from the solar perspective that it has been a safe haven. and. We have, in fact, an RFP request for proposal deadline uh, this week for, according to Helco, Hiko Miko, for as many as 900 megawatts across their five service territories. And that, that's a lot. That's a lot of, of capacity. And so the, the deadline is this week, and then they're expected to announce the winners um, sometime May of next year. So, you know, we're, we definitely have some good stuff going on. Uh, in terms of over the next two, three, four, five years, there's going to be a substantial amount of solar plus uh, storage deployment. It's kind of what do we do? What do we do in the in the interim? And you know, the the key one of the keys to figure out key conundrums is one needs a certain amount of spinning reserve or or generation that is combustion based with a turbine that goes around and around, generator that goes around and around, uh, in order to to make up for times when the sun doesn't shine enough or the batteries aren't fully enough charged. So there's, there's, as we get higher and higher in terms of renewable penetration, which everybody's forecasting we will, what's the minimum amount of combustion generation that we will need to, to have a resilient grid, because everybody wants resiliency and the grid is going to stay on. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, more into the, the, the great new frontier uh, as far as uh, you know, these laboratories that are the islands in our state. and I, it's easy to kind of get frustrated about lack of progress, but at the same time, we're, we're going where few utilities and few states have gone before. And uh, I never ascribe to others, uh, even though I may disagree with them, that you know, they're, they're motivated by some type of malicious uh, or negative intent. Yeah, well, I, you know? That takes us back to the beginning. That takes us back to where we started the show. I can't disagree with you, your answer and with the analysis you make, but I do want to say that it's gratuitous 
to have violence and to protest after a project has been approved, right down to dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and then go out in the street and protest that. Um, yeah. I don't want to put a characterization on it, but it is not good. And uh, if there's one thing that would scare me in Wall Street, it would be that kind of thing, uh, a, a refusal to accept the rule of law. So th that is probably as damaging as anything else we can identify. And I hope they stop. I really do. Uh, anyway. Well, that's interesting the contrast. You know, Jay, that uh, the HPD there on Oahu has been quite active in arresting people by the dozens when necessary. And here, this is month four now, since the, the road to the mountain, uh, Monica Access Road, has been closed down. And, uh, I mean, I drove uh, over the saddle road a couple weeks ago. I hadn't been up there in months. And uh, there's, there's a veritable tent community up there. I mean, you got people who are parked on, not just parked on, but, uh, you know, camping there in the lava fields and have been there for months. So, uh, you know, well, maybe the Big Island can learn some stuff from Oahu. From HPD. Yeah. Anyway, we got to go, Marco. I, okay. I so look forward Pleasure. to our next discussion. Um, there's Thanks. so Thanks there's so much. so much more to cover. Marco Manglestor, Provision Solar in Hilo. Thank you so much here on Energy 808. Aloha. Thanks so much, Jay.